Hi, Chris Joseph here. Just taking a, the little, a look at the little boat Moonlight and thinking about one of the biggest problems that people have with wooden boats and that is keeping them watertight. So I want to have a look at how the different joints work and how they work to keep a traditional wooden boat watertight and what needs to be done to keep it that way. This boat's kept in a very demanding environment. It's uh, a, a garage which faces the west and when the sun hits that roller door there it can get quite warm in here potentially up to 45 degrees or more. I've talked before about how in traditional clinker construction or Nordic designs or in some places they might call it uh, uh, lap strake um, how does that actually work to keep the water out? It all relies on the fact that timber is hygroscopic and that means that it takes in moisture and it loses moisture constantly for the life of the timber. It never loses that capacity. It's like a sponge in that respect. So if the humidity is high, then the timber will take on more moisture from the air. If it's immersed in the water, then it will take in water from uh, below the water line or water from inside the boat. And all that is continually changing the dimensions of the timber. So with a clinker built boat, you have what's called lands. So a land is the space between one plank and the next. In this case, the shear strake and the second strake. The land here is about three quarters of an inch wide. And then it's clinched together using these copper rivets. On the outside, like that, and on the inside the copper rivets are clenched over with a rove. So that pulls it together. So there's nothing between the seams, unlike in a plywood boat where you might glue those seams. In traditional construction there is no glue. It relies purely on the accuracy of that joint and that land and the ability of the timber to expand to close up any, uh, any little gaps there and, pretend, and uh, prevent moisture from getting in. And I use a traditional oil-based varnish and that oil-based varnish uh, is a, it's not a completely watertight barrier like epoxy for example. It's what they call a semi-permeable membrane. In other words it allows moisture to move through it in both directions to whichever side has the lowest moisture content. So it effectively allows, you, you might hear people saying the timber's got to be allowed to breathe. Well, conventional terps based um, varnish like this does allow that moisture to move backwards and forwards and not quite correctly, but it's often spoken of as the ability to breathe. <clears throat> so what happens when a boat like this is left in a shed and out of the water for a long time is the timber will shrink to reflect the humidity in the atmosphere and that might open up some little joints so when you first put the boat back in the water you would expect that it's going to leak somewhat there were times when the boat has leaked quite a lot other times uh, very little and these days it, it leaks very little so the, the space between the lands between the planks is is uh, one place that water can get in. Uh, Hewn pine is a very stable timber and because of that moonlight has rarely leaked very much. Uh, but just in case she does leak I carry this. So the nature of clinker built construction being such that it will allow moisture to get into the boat when you first put it in the water especially um, I carry one of these which is a little thirsty bilge pump, thirsty mate bilge pump which is as old as the boat and it allows you to get right down into the bilge there uh, because the nature of the construction is such that uh, bailing out could be quite difficult. You can, you can pump it out completely dry with a little, little pump like that, nice and light because it's plastic and not metal it's not going to damage the paintwork. So let's have a look at some of the areas where moisture can get in, starting from the stern. So you can see that on the external end, this boat's got a little inboard motor in it, and on the uh, on the uh, external 
um, part of the shaft we've installed a stuffing box and a stuffing box works by having hemp um, which is uh, impregnated with um, I don't know exactly what they do use, but, you know, some kind of wax and oil, uh, quite a heavy wax and oil in there. And by clenching, undoing these nuts and closing up the stuffing box, you can compress the stuffing which is in that gland so that it presses on the shaft and prevents moisture from getting in. But even with that, there will be some water that comes through because you can't have it so tight that it heats the shaft and there will be a little bit of leak, especially when it's running. So. The way that we've um, got around that problem in moonlight is also used another stuffing box on the inside which also serves as, to take some of the thrust. We've then got a pillow block with the thrust bearing and a flexible coupling to the motor to allow me to take the motor out. But uh, working at its best there will be a little drip or two that comes through there as it's running. It's designed to be that way and uh, to try and eliminate it completely uh, would be futile. So that's the making the shaft watertight. The next most likely place that you're going to get a leak in a boat like this is the centre board around the centre case. And when, uh, when the centre case is installed in the boat it's bedded in. We used to use red lead paint it, put the two surfaces together, detect where the high spots are, plane stuff off so that you get a really good fit and then in this case it was glued down I think, no probably not, uh, in this case it was bedded into butyl mastic. Now once that's all in there, it's there for the life of the boat, there's really not much you can do about it. So there was a time when moonlight did start to leak around the base of the centre case and the way that I overcame that was I I worked uh, from up from underneath and worked some um, Sikaflex, I think it was at the time, into the joints thoroughly and it's never leaked from there since. But it does get quite a bit of, um, of stress on here when you're healing in a, in a decent breeze and it, it will work to some extent. So to have it so that it's flexible is a good thing. So we eliminated it there, but I think it was mainly eliminated by coating it with uh, Sikaflex on the inside. I think the, um, the beautiful mastic has probably given up a long time ago. But to take that out is a really, that's you know, quite a big job. It can be done, uh, and one day we might, but it's not needed at the moment because it's not leaking. Now, um, <clears throat> the next most likely place for a leak to occur is along what's called the garboard seam, the garboard strake. So the garboard strake is this first one and it was steamed into place and at her very worst moonlight uh, was leaking quite a lot and this is where it was coming from. So the garboard seam which is against the keel is stuffed full of corking, which is cotton, and uh, and put into place with a corking iron, and then we used butyl mastic to seal over the top of that. And it was very good for about the first 20 years, and then she did start to leak quite a lot. And what I did at that time was I thought, well, surely something better uh, has has been produced for that particular job. So I actually raked out all the cork and cotton and the old butyl mastic which by that stage had really pretty much broken down and I filled the joint with high expansion, um, the best quality Sikaflex that I could get my hands on at the time and it's totally paintable and then again solvent based paint, terps based paint um, and guess what? never leaked since. It's, we've gone a, a good decade now, even with the extremes of this environment that we have here. Subtropical climate and just with the sun beating down on this, this garage door um, it's, it's just never leaked. And you can see here uh, it's butyl, uh, sorry, it's Sikaflex up to about this point here and then from then on it's been 
originally glued with aerodite which is a form of flexible epoxy and again no ingress of water here whatsoever. So turning it upside down and filling that garbage seam did a wonderful job and it's just been a pleasure ever since. A lot of people make a really big mistake here with timber boats and they try to overcome the leakages that you get around this area by fiberglassing the bottom. It's the worst thing that you can possibly do. You put epoxy or fiberglass over that, it's an impermeable barrier. There will always be moisture on the inside and there will be moisture that comes down from the inside when the boat gets some water in it. And that moisture will find its way to the surface between the fiberglass and the timber. It will sit there and it will, in 100% of cases, rot the timber and eventually the boat will be worthless. So I remember John Philp, my mentor, when I built this, he said, you fiberglass it, you might as well just take the boat straight to the landfill because um, it's, it really is the death of many timber boats. You'll notice here there's a scarf. You can see that line. So this is a scarf joint in the stem post and that can also be a point of water ingress. There is a, a dowel which goes through just under the, um, the rebate here and that dowel is a water stop. So it prevents water that might move up here from actually moving through to the inside of the boat um, because that dowel will swell up and prevent that. We've never had a problem there. You'll also get some movement along these joints. You can see that there's very little, but I dare say there would be some hairlines along there. And um, again, when I painted this last, which was about 10 years ago, I think, um, I, uh, I did just put a very, very thin seam of Sikaflex along this joint before I painted it. And again, the flexibility of those two products compensates for any movement in the timber and they've never opened up and, and we've never had any leakage below the waterline uh, of any consequence. A tiny little bit is always forgivable, but um, what you don't want is uh, you know, so much water coming in that you're spending half your day pumping. That pretty much covers it, I think. I can't think of too many other places where water can get in. But uh, yeah, so, so don't fiberglass. Um, you can't beat it, you've got to work with it rather than against it. Just work with the fact that you're using natural products, natural processes, and work with them, not against them, by trying to use some chemical solution. Uh, so none of these joints are glued. There would be a bit of paint and a bit of varnish that's gone in here into the joints over time, and certainly uh, I did run a fine seam of sickle flex along here on the joints between all the paints below the waterline, and then painted it with um, solvent based, uh, good old fashioned tips based enamel. So that's the story. Moonlight is pretty much a dry boat. Um, I dare say next time I put her in I might get in the first couple of hours maybe two to four litres of water might seep in and about then it just takes up and all the timber expands and just fills any cracks that are there and it just doesn't leak anymore. You'd be at sea for a week and not have to bail.